Bless every graduate and the families rep represented here. In God's name we pray, amen. Hello? Okay. Can I have all the kids come up to for the children's story? And today we're not going to be picking up offering, just so I'll just invite all the kids to come up over. You guys can sit on the floor too. No, come on. It's all these kids. Okay. Alrighty. Hi guys. My name is Isai. How are you guys doing today? Happy Sabbath. How are you guys doing? Um, so, I'm gonna ask you guys a question. Okay, and I want you guys to like answer honest, honestly. Okay. Have you guys made mistakes before? Yes or no? I'm going to ask the graduates, have you guys made mistakes before? Yes? Okay. Um, is it easy to make mistakes? Yes, it is very easy, right? Um, I write a lot of papers. Uh, I'm a history major, um, and I write a lot of papers, and um, my history professors can acknowledge that I write a lot of mistakes. Um, and the thing about mistakes is that the more you do them, sometimes the better you're writing as a hist like when I write papers, the better I become, right? So I learn from my mistakes and I keep working hard to make better changes to my papers, right? So do you guys know the story of Jonah? Yes? Okay, I'm gonna tell you guys a little bit of Jonah, right? So Jonah, he was a prophet, right? And he was called by God to basically go and tell this group of people that were really, really bad. Like, they were really, really bad. They did not care about people. They hurt people. And they were doing a mistake, right? Like, they were hurting people. They were doing things that were not correct. That's a mistake, right? So when... God told Jonah, hey, go to Nineveh. And Jonah did not want to go because it was Israelite. And that was basically the arch nemesis of the Israelites, right? And he did not want to go because why was God calling him to help his enemy? So Jonah did a mistake. And he did not listen to God. And he went on the opposite direction, right? So he did not want to go help out these people. And that was a mistake because God had called him to do it. And so what did he end up doing? He goes into a boat. There's a big storm. And he gets thrown off ship. And you guys remember what happens afterwards, right? There's a big fish that eats him. And for three days, he was stuck in this fish's belly, right? And during this time was when he realized that he made a mistake. Um, there's a whole chapter in the Bible where it's like he's just basically praying to God. And three days after, what happened? The fish spit him out, right? And he ended up fixing mistake and going and saving the people of Nineveh. And the people from Nineveh, like I said, they also had made a huge mistake, right? They had been evil. They were hurting people and everything. And they decided to change. And so that's two mistakes fixed, right? Maybe one small mistake, but then a big city was saved, right? And they fixed their mistakes. So sometimes it's hard to fix mistakes, right? Like sometimes you want to lie automatically and not want to do, like you don't want to own up to your mistakes, right? But sometimes the thing about mistakes is owning up to it, be, being truthful, you know, if you do something, you know, that your parents don't like, that's a mistake, right? And sometimes all you have to go up to them and say, I'm sorry, 
right? And, you know, that is what Jonah did. He called on God and he prayed and he asked for forgiveness. And I think sometimes making mistakes feels like, you know, you can't do much and, oh, like I'm so scared. But sometimes all you have to do is ask for forgiveness. So remember that. Already? Already. I'm going to pray and then you guys can go back to your seats. Already? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you that you brought us to church safely. Please take care of each and every kid and um, help us to learn how to ask for forgiveness when we have made a mistake. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, guys. Good morning, church family. Happy Sabbath. So today's offering is going to the PC Worthy Student, Worthy Student Fund. This fund affects almost all students who attend PUC. Without this fund, we wouldn't be here. So from all the students at PUC, thank you for your offering. Thank you for your generosity and your care and your kindness. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Thank you for this wonderful weekend where our families and graduates can come together to celebrate. I pray that you may bless this offering and may it touch many more lives as it goes forward. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Happy Sabbath, church. Happy Sabbath. So um, we have a few of our students who are not graduating performing with us, um, but we would like to sing for you guys um, a song with uh, a meaning of basically Jesus is going to uh, go back up to heaven and he's telling his disciples, though I leave, I'm not saying goodbye to you guys. I'm going to be present with you guys evermore. And so I think this song is a good reminder that as we each leave here, as we, as we graduate and move into the next phases of our life, just remembering that mission that Jesus leaves for us to love him and to love others. And so I'm here with TJ Asuri, Chelsea Asuri, Lily Chafee, and then we have Layla Belchen on the piano, and then we have Pastor Lem on the guitar. And so um, whenever you guys are ready. See my hands and look at my feet It's okay if it's hard to believe I have faith that you will do greater things It's my time to go But before I leave Go tell the world about me I was dead but now I live I've got to go now for a little while The goodbye is not the end Forget the things that I taught you I've conquered death and I hold the keys Where I go, you will go to someday But there's much to do here before you leave Goodbye is 
not the end of the journey, the end of the road. My spirit is with you wherever you go. You have a purpose and I have a plan. I'll make you this promise. I'll come back again, but until then, go tell the world about me. I was dead, but now I live. I've got to go now for a Happy Sabbath. Today's scripture reading will be coming from Matthew chapter 5, verse 16. Please stand. And I will be reading it in English. And the word reads, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. I'll be reading in Bisaya Cebuano, Mateo 5, 16. Pusa ipadan ag gayod ang inyong kahayag at tubangan sa mga tao aron makita nila ang inyong mga maayong buhat o magdayag sila sa inyong amahan nga at tua sa langit. And I'll be reading in Spanish. Así alumbra vuestra luz delante de los hombres para que vean vuestras buenas obras y glorifiquen a vuestro Padre que está en los cielos. You may be seated. Today, I have the wonderful pleasure of introducing our speaker, Pastor Shonda M. Nunes Henry. Pastor Nunes Henry was born and raised in Toronto, Canada by two God-fearing parents. She recognized her call to ministry at the early age of nine and credits church leaders who acknowledge this by giving her leadership roles. In addition to her religious degrees, a BA and an MDiv, she also holds a couple of interesting degrees. She holds an associate degree in private investigation and paralegal studies and is a certified life coach. Pastor Nunes Henry began her pastoral journey in 2003 at a college church in Berman University and has ministered in many different roles since. She has served as a youth pastor, as an elementary and boarding school pastor, as an administrative pastor, a family pastor, and most recently, as the lead pastor here at PUC Church. Pastor Nunes has led us through some interesting times. She was here when we first got COVID and really helped this church through that very tumultuous time that I'm sure you can all remember. Uh, Pastor Nunes most recently has become the Vice President of Administration for the Nevada Utah Conference. She is an ordained minister. Pastor Nunes Henry is a trailblazer and has been the first in every position she has held. Some would even call her a pioneer. She is married to Keith A. Henry of Oakland, California, who is currently enjoying his recent retirement. In March, they will, they will have celebrated their one year anniversary. Her favorite scripture is Psalms 91, one through two, which reads, he who dwells in the secret place of the most high shall abide under my shadow of the almighty. I shall say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. My God in him, I will trust. Please join me in welcoming Pastor Shonda M. Nunez Henry. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you, Brother Ty. Brother Ty and his family always made sure that I was good when I was here. So thank you. Thank you. Good morning and happy Sabbath, everyone. This is the day that the Lord has made, so let us all rejoice and be glad in it. I am beyond excited to be back home. Can I say that I'm back home? I am beyond excited to say that I am beyond, I'm, I am back home to celebrate with you all on this auspicious occasion. There's an old saying that says, home is where the heart is, right? But it, it can also be added that home is where the Wi-Fi connects. And so according to my phone, I am right back here at home. I have missed you all greatly. I bring you greetings from the administration of the Nevada Utah Conference, and they have expressed their congratulations to each and every one of our graduates. I'm also excited to introduce to you my husband, Keith, who is snapping photos of me. Babe, can you stand for a second? When I left you, I, I, I wasn't married. I came back married. This is my husband, Keith. And he is no stranger to this campus. In fact, um, when he was a, a student um, at MBA and at uh, Golden Gate Academy, he frequented this campus for choral fests and for choir fests and for sporting events. And so when I arrived on this campus, I was like, oh, I don't know where this is. And he would just be like, this is where you need to go. And so I am uh, grateful for him. He is my ride and die partner. And he celebrated his birthday yesterday. Yesterday. And um, so happy birthday, babe. And I actually, as a side note, I actually offered to fly him to Miami, Florida this weekend because one of his absolute favorite speakers is speaking down there, but he said he'd settle for his second favorite preacher. So that's all right. That's all right. Also, Dr. Davis, where are you? I saw you. You brought us, where, wave your hand. Wave your hand. Happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. One of my favorites here. Um, it, is, it is just so good to see so many beautiful and, and smiling faces. I want to thank the class of 2023 and its officers for the extension of this invitation. I am so glad to be here to share this day with you all. Uh, when I received the call, I was extremely humbled and honored um, that I had been selected for this. I had the opportunity to journey with so many of you over the past few years, and it is awesome to be back to help you celebrate this milestone that rests in front of you. To Dr. Tricartan, I know I saw you there, Dr. T and every single faculty and staff member, I want you to know that I pray for each of you daily. And I know that God will continue to imbue his wisdom on you as you lead, guide, influence, and educate every single student that you encounter. To my brother from another mother, Pastor Nate, I wanna thank you so much for sharing your pulpit with me today. May God continue to richly bless everything that you and your team are doing here to lead people to the throne of God. Can we get into the swing of things? My, I need you to talk back to me. You guys didn't forget to talk back to me, right? Can we get into the swing of things? All right. So my sermon today is entitled, This Little Light of Mine. Will you pray with me? Holy Spirit, you are welcome here in this place. As we are gathered, Lord God, we open our hearts, our minds, we open our entire beings to you, and we ask you now to speak, Lord. Speak, Lord, to the depths of our heart. May the words that are shared here today not return void. This is our prayer in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. The month of April marked a significant milestone in my life. In fact, just a few weeks ago, I returned to my very own alma mater, Berman University, for my 20th year class reunion. I was also awarded Alumni of the Year. And I have to tell you something, it felt really great to be remembered. That's right, 20 years ago, I sat exactly where you were sitting. 
And to be honest with you, there's not much I remember <laughs> about the baccalaureate sermon or the commencement address. The weekend happened so quickly. But here's what I do remember about that weekend. We were tired because of finals week, right? And we were tired of having to wake up and we were tired of having to go to rehearsals. Uh, we, we were hungry. I remember we were very hungry because as good college students do, we skip breakfast. So we were hungry and we wanted, we wanted lunch and uh, mostly we couldn't wait to get free of our caps and gowns. But what I could tell you is that while I do remember the names of the baccalaureate and the commencement speakers and that their sermons were extremely dynamic, they seemed to take an eternity. And if I could be frank with you, I don't remember a thing. And so when I was asked to come and be your baccalaureate speaker, I was excited, but I was low-key fearful because I couldn't help but think to myself, oh man, I'm going to be one of those guys. Uh, like I'm going to be the guy that came to your baccalaureate, uh, that guy that you don't even remember what I said 20 years from now. And the reality is we all want to be remembered, right? Well, that's where we land in the midst of our story today. We're looking at someone who was forgotten, someone who wasn't even remembered by his own family. I invite you to open your Bibles with me or turn in your Bible apps to 1 Samuel chapter 16. 1 Samuel chapter 16. And while I was your pastor here, I always encourage you to find a Bible that you could read and understand easily on the first time you read the scripture. All right? So we're in 1 Samuel chapter 16. And uh, if you would permit me, I'm going to read this story from the message paraphrase. It's beautifully stated, 1 Samuel 16, starting at verse 1, and we're going all the way to verse 13. And the word of God reads, God addressed Samuel. So how long are you going to mope over Saul? You know, I've rejected him as king over Israel. Go, fill your flask with anointing oil and get going. I'm sending you to Jesse at Bethlehem. I've spotted the very king I want among his sons, said God. I can't do that, said Samuel. Saul will hear about it and he'll kill me. God said to Samuel, okay, take a heifer with you and announce, I've come to lead you in worship of God with this heifer as a sacrifice. Now make sure that Jesse gets invited and then I'll let you know what to do. I'll point out which one to anoint. We're in verse 4. Samuel did what God told him to do. When he arrived at Bethlehem, the town fathers came out to greet him, but apprehensively. Is there something wrong? Oh, no, nothing is wrong. I've come to sacrifice this heifer and to lead you in worship of God. Prepare yourselves, be consecrated, and join me in worship. Now, he made sure that Jesse and his sons were also consecrated and called to worship. When they arrived, Samuel took one look at Eliab and thought, hmm, here he is, God's anointed. Verse 7, but God told Samuel, listen, looks aren't everything. Don't be impressed with his looks and his stature. I've already eliminated him. Listen, God judges people differently than humans do. Men and women look at the face, but God looks at the heart. Jesse then calls up Abinadab, and he presented him to Samuel. And Samuel said, this isn't God's choice either. Next, Jesse brings Shaman, and Samuel says, no, it's not him either. Jesse goes on to present seven, his seven sons to Samuel. Samuel was blunt with Jesse. God hasn't chosen any of them. Verse 11. 
Then he asked Jesse, is this it? Are there no more sons? Well, yeah, there's one, but he's a runt. But he's out tending sheep. Samuel ordered Jesse, go and get him. We are not moving from this spot until he's right here. So Jesse sent for him, and he was brought in, the very picture of health, bright-eyed and good-looking. God said, everyone, up on your feet. Anoint him. This is the one. The final verse, verse 13. So Samuel took his flask of oil, and he anointed him with his brothers standing around watching. And the Spirit of God entered David like a rush of wind, God vitally empowering him for the rest of his life. Amen? Listen, three simple lessons, and I'm going to get out of your way. Because I know that I'm standing between you and lunch. All right? <laughs> So the first lesson that we can learn from this story is to trust God's plan. Trust God's plan. To every person sitting under my voice or watching online, God has a plan for your life. And here's what's crazy about the story, because David had been forgotten. No one remembers him. And watch this now, while his whole family... His father and all of his brothers get invited to a praise and worship consecration service, not to mention that they're serving some good barbecue. David was not invited. No one remembers him. No one remembers to say, come join the festivities. Come join the feast that is before him. David was left out in the field to tend sheep. And the scripture spells out for us the low regard that David had among his own family. Now, not only does he not get invited to the sacrificial feast, his father, when asked if there were any other sons, doesn't even call him by his name, but calls him a runt. And the kicker in all of this is that not only, the only reason that he ends up getting called to the feast is because Samuel calls for him. The fact of the matter is, when others can't see God's plans for your lives, they will try to impose their own plans on you. And David's family had a plan for him, and that was for him to keep on keeping the sheep. But God, God was up to his own plans. And so he has Samuel bring David to the forefront. And in that moment, he, God reveals to Samuel, this is our guy. This is the one that I've called. This is the one that I have chosen. His family may have forgotten him, but I, God, have not forgotten him. And God said to Samuel, get up on your feet, anoint him. This is the one. And the Bible tells us that, that Samuel takes the flask of oil and he pours it on the top of his head and he anoints him. Watch this now, verse 13, with his brothers and his father who had forgotten him, they were now standing there watching what was happening. And this gives us a whole new meaning to the 23rd Psalm when David declares, you prepared a table before me in the presence of those who didn't remember me. Or you prepared a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anointed my head with oil and my cup overflows. And then I love what the Bible says next because it says that the Spirit of God entered into David like a rushing wind and God empowered him all the days of his life. Please note, please note, please note that God often chooses unlikely people to do his work. Why? So that everyone will know that it is God that is at work and not man's own doing. 
God had a plan for David's life and God has a plan for each and every one of you. The first lesson we learn is to trust God's plan. The second lesson that we learn is to trust God's timing. Trust God's timing. In the biblical languages, there are two types of time. There is chronos time, which should sound familiar to you because this is where we get our English root word for chronological. That simply means the arrangements of dates and events in order and an order of occurrence. It's, it's often the way that we want things to personally happen. For example, we say we want to graduate college this weekend and find a six-figure income job and get married and have 1.2 children and live in a beautiful home and have at least two cars, one boat, and a dog. Chronological time is how things happen or how we want things to happen. But then there's this other type of time that the Bible mentions. And that type of time is called kairos. Can you say kairos with me? Kairos. And what kairos means is not just at any time, but at the right time, at the right place, in the right situation. It's a, a, a supernatural Holy Spirit kind of time. Galatians 4 verse 4 tells us that when the fullness of time came or when the kairos had taken its course that God sent his son into the world. Kairos. It signifies a moment of undefined time in which something special happens. And this was that moment. This is David's Kairos moment. Yes, David was called for this great anointing, and yes, one day he would be appointed king, but all of this took place while he was out keeping the sheep. <laughs> he was out keeping the sheep. David simply did the task that he was assigned to do. David was faithful in the small things. And Luke 16 tells us, tells us that when we are faithful in the little things, when we are faithful in the small things, when we take care of the menial things, it tells us that we will be entrusted with greater things. Mm, understand now that, that David's years of keeping sheep was not wasted time. It was a training time. Keeping sheep meant that you had a lot of time to think. Keeping sheep meant that you had a lot of time to spend admiring God's creation. Keeping sheep meant that you had time to talk with God and get to know the deeper things of him. Keeping sheep meant that you had to trust God in the midst of dangerous situations when predatory animals would come your way. Keeping the sheep took someone with a special heart who, who took care and understood exactly the need of every single sheep. Keeping the sheep taught David how to be patient and loving and how to be a good shepherd. So now, watch this now, because when this Kairos moment takes place, when this appointed moment takes place in the life of David so that he becomes anointed and called to be king, he now has the skills. He now has the wisdom. He now has the life lessons and experiences that he needs to function in the full capacity of being a ruler over the nation of Israel. To everybody sitting here under my voice, keep on keeping the sheep. Keep on keeping your sheep. And I need somebody to get this down in your spirit on this Sabbath day. Don't ever think that God is not at work in your life. He is making things happen even when it doesn't seem like it. God knows how to bless us. He knows when we'll be ready. And in some cases, he knows who to bless us right in front of. Not just at any time, but in the kairos, the appointed time. So the second lesson that we learn is to trust God's timing. The third and final lesson that we learn from this story is to trust God's word. 
Trust God's word. In this, in this story that we read, the prophet Samuel is our lead example. He believed the word that God spoke to him about who to anoint. When God said, nope, not that one, that one, Samuel took God at his word. And because he did, when he anoints David, we're not told what he said, but it must have been something powerful because the Bible tells us that the Spirit of God comes upon him like a rushing wind and he's empowered for the rest of his life. Whew. Words have power. Proverbs 18, 21 says that life and death lies in the power of the tongue. Listen, had David took the words of his family to heart, you're too young, you're too small, you're not worthy to be invited to family gatherings or to important gatherings, you're just a runt, essentially saying you don't matter, your life doesn't matter, that's how David would have continued living his life. Tending sheep, boxed in. But guess what, y'all? David doesn't concern himself with those things. He doesn't take to heart what the people around him are saying. Instead, he stays faithful at what he was called to do for that period of time. And so during that period of time, he perfects his skills as a musician. And he learns to play a harp. And eventually, he's called before a king to minister to him because the king is distressed. He perfects his writing skills. He pens at least 73 psalms, if not more, featured in the Bible. Lord, you are my shepherd. I shall not want. Lord, I, I give you praise. He says, oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. Lord, you are my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? He perfects his writing skills. He also perfects his skills with a slingshot. And one day... Because he perfected that skill, he's able to wipe out a nation's bully, Goliath. Words have power. And Samuel spoke the words of God over David's life. And he speaks those words over every single person's life sitting here today. Now, you may be sitting back wondering, has God really spoken over my life? Like, has God said something specifically about me and for me? And my answer to you is yes. Well, what has God said about me? Well, I'm so glad you asked. Because the Bible shares with us that God has declared over your life that you are saved that you have been bought with a price, that you are complete in him, that you possess his strength, that you have authority, that you are his child, that you are redeemed and you are free from sin. He says that you are more than a conqueror and that you are filled with his mercy and his grace. He has said, you are my creation. You are loved by God. You are forgiven by God. You have been chosen by me, he says. You have been called called to do great things. He says, you are safe in me. You are victorious. You are not condemned. You are healed. You are not alone. You are sufficient. You are blessed. You are special to God. You are joyful. You are alive. You are precious to him. You are his friend. He, you have been created for good works. You are accepted and worthy. You, you are filled with boldness and confidence. You, you will lack nothing. You are protected. And guess what, y'all? You are the apple of his eye. And literally in the word of God, there are over 7,000 promises and statements that God has spoken over each and every one of our lives. Words have power. God's word literally spoke this entire universe into being. And I don't know about you, but hearing what God has spoken over my life makes me want to stand up a little bit taller. 
it, it makes me want to hold my head up a little bit higher and it makes me want to shine just a little bit brighter and I pray that it makes you feel the same way too so to every graduate and everyone sitting here today and those who are watching online go let your light shine accept what God has spoken over your life and then go go and let your light shine don't hide it under the bushel no go and let your light shine and I don't care whether you become a nurse or a doctor or a teacher or a lawyer or an author or whether you're walking down the street and you smile at somebody or you're sweeping your neighbor's porch go and let your light shine because of the insurance that God has spoken over your lives. Let your light so shine before men so that they will see your good works and they will glorify your Father which is in heaven. Go let your light shine. Trust God's plans. He says he has plans for you, plans to prosper you, plans for good future for you, a, a future that will not harm you. Yes, you may not know the next step, but he says, Jan, I've got plans for you. Audrey, here's what's next. Alex, here's where I want you to go. Misa, here's what I want you to do. God has plans for you. Trust his plans. Trust his timing. Don't rush. Instead of lying awake at night counting sheep, talk to the shepherd. Wait on him. Delays are not denials. Just wait on God's perfect timing. Keep on keeping the sheep. Don't try to bless yourself. Put the work in. Be faithful in the small things. And God will come through in the kairos, the appointed time. Again, the third, trust God's word. What he has spoken over your life is 100. It, it's facts. It's legit. So let people say what they want to say. But here's the deal. Other people's opinions of me will never change God's plans for me. No, I'm going to say that again because that warrants a bigger amen, Pastor Nate. What other people have to say about me will never change God's plans for me. Listen, say it like David did. He said, you come at me with the sword and shield or you, coming at, you come at me with your negative words, will I come at you in the name of the Lord. Finally, as the Spirit of the Lord came upon David like a rushing wind, may it also come upon you and stay with you all the days of your life. Not so that you would become kings and queens over vast domains, but so wherever you go and whatever you do, you will let your light shine for him. And that is my prayer for each and every one of you. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Uh, if everybody could please stand for our next hymn. It's found in the hymnal number 619, and it's Lead On, O King Eternal. Bye. 
You may be seated. Thank you. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for your message. We thank you for your love. We thank you for filling this place with your spirit. Lead us on, O King Eternal. We thank you for your Sabbath. Bless us all in your name. Amen.